I'm going to start today's lesson in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. The book of Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. A, a couple of weeks back, I said to you, your number one mission in life is to be the person God created you to be. Right. Your number one mission is not to buy a house or get a car or get a job, whatever. Those are all part of life, part of living, part of experiencing this realm. But your number one mission is to be the person God created you to be. When you get to heaven, you want the Father to say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's not dependent on the stuff you bought or what you owned. That's not dependent on the job you had. That's dependent on your relationship with him and living the life that God called you to live. Well done, good and faithful servant. So I want to take the word dream and I want to use each letter of the word dream quickly to tell you what it means to have a dream that drives you. First of all, the D stands for a dream will distinguish you. When God gives you a dream, it will make you stand out. When God gives you a dream, it will mark you. It will make you, uh, it will make you different from other people. All you have to do in this day and time is in, to, be, to be really something is to have a dream and a direction for your life. A dream will distinguish you. Joseph had a coat of many colors. He looked like Elton John everywhere he went. He had, he had, a, he had a dream. He had a dream, and the dream distinguished him. And I tell you, when a young person or a man or a woman is a person who God has given a dream, they will begin, their, they will begin to be distinguished from others other people. The second thing that a dream will do is a dream, and I want to say before I move on, if you don't have a dream, hang out with someone who does have a dream because you'll get fat off the crumbs from their table. There's something about when you hang around other dreamers, you can get a dream, but some of you hang around a bunch of losers and you'll never be and do anything of significance. So get around people who have a dream and then you'll begin to see what you can be, and what you can do. Hunger is a place of humility which keeps us in a place of dependency. In Isaiah 29, it says, the hunger causes people to dream. Hunger actually releases dreams. Those who don't have passion, those who, don't have, who have lost the desire for life, those who have lost the desire for expansion, for progression, for advancement, for building their vision, uh, their, their business, uh, uh, increasing uh, the strength of their marriage, their home. The people who have lost those kinds of dreams and visions, it's just because they've lost hunger. They've lost the ability to pursue and to ask for answers to get breakthrough. The Lord has made you to be hungry. Proverbs mentions, Solomon in Proverbs mentions this kind of an interesting verse. He says, you know, he says, we don't blame someone because they stole when they were hungry to feed their family. They still have to pay back seven times what they took. But at least we understood that it was hunger that drove them to cross the lines, the boundaries. Hunger has a motivation uh, hung, hunger has a, a motivating factor that causes people to move out of themselves into something greater, out of their convenience, um, out of some people who, who, who get everything given to them and there's passion is never expressed in their life. They never discover who God made them to be. They never discovered because really the richness of who God's made you to be is found in passion in hunger, in pursuing after things. So here you are, you get filled with what God is saying and promising and doing, and yet we have this strange requirement to maintain hunger. And if I don't maintain hunger, then I will live off the interest of yesterday's investment, and I no longer get put into a place where I become a transforming influence in society because God has reserved transforming influence to the hungry. It is true. The R stands for dreams release your potential. They release you to grow. 
I mentioned the other week in a message, and I want to reiterate, you know, um, I, I heard and saw a little TV show even this week that reminded me about these guys make aquariums. And he said something interesting when they, especially for CEOs, uh, you know, where they put fish and stuff in, in, their, in their fancy offices. And he said that the number one fish that people want in their aquarium is, a, I, I thought he'd say, you know, a guppy or something. He said a shark. He said, he said CEOs want a shark. And, um, and, and, and he said, the amazing thing is if you put a shark in the, in the aquarium, it'll only grow to, to eight inches. But if you put it in the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean, it'll grow eight feet or more. And the point is simply this, the shark will never grow larger than his environment. And the same is true about you. If all you do is stay in little, little narrow-minded, muddy mud puddles of small thinking, you'll never grow any bigger. Well, but there's a verse that in my 20s, I, it used to bug me. I, it, would, it, would, it would stress me out. Jesus said twice, he said, many are called, but few are chosen. And I'm passionate, and I'm in my 20s, and I want to change the world, and I want to go after God. And I would read that verse, and I'd be like, I don't understand that verse, but it drives me crazy. Like, why are many called, but few are chosen? I'd get before the Lord in prayer and be like, Lord, I don't want to be in the called category. I want to be in the chosen category. I don't just want to be called. I want to be chosen. But I don't know how you get from called to chosen. And why are many called, but few are chosen? And it would just stress me out. And then I read that verse in context. In Matthew 22, Jesus is telling a story about a king. And a king sends an invitation out to come to the wedding of his son. And the first wave of people that he sends, the first invitations, all of the people, they all have excuses. They all downplay and they all have reasons why they don't come to the wedding. Then there's the second invitation that goes out. The second invitation, they all have excuses why they don't either. Finally, on the third, they come. And then he ends the story by saying, many are called, but few are chosen. This is the illustration we use with this. One of the things I hate in life, like hate with a, with a passion, is moving, like physically moving. I hate moving. I did it a year ago. Like when I lived in Reading, we lived in a house for 14 years. I didn't want to move. It just, I, I hate moving. I hate the whole pro. I, I hate packing. I hate thinking about it. I hate having to load it up. I hate having to go get the U-Haul. I, I hate... I hate moving furniture through doorways and it doesn't fit and you're banging your hands the whole time. I hate that it's in the middle of the summer and it's 110. I hate unpacking. I hate the whole thing with a, with a deep passion. But what I hate more than moving is I hate helping other people move. I hate that even worse. I hate it even worse. And and you know, and it's always like people, all, what they're asking you is, can you give up an entire Saturday in the middle of July when it's 110? And can you come to my house and move a bunch of furniture through doors and pack and take your whole day? And what I'm going to do as a thank you is give you a few slices of pizza. This is what they're asking. And then it drives me crazy if they like do little Facebook invites, like they start a little moving group and they call it like, we're having a moving party on Saturday, do you wanna come? As if that's fooling anybody. <laughs> a party, yes! No, I don't wanna come. But the problem is, and this is what we talk about, is that in America, and if you're from another country, it could be the same there, but in America, the true test of friendship is whether or not you'll show up and help somebody move, <laughs> easily. If you are unsure or uncertain if this person's a friend, tell them you're moving on Saturday. If they show up, they're a friend. If they don't, they were lying and faking it the entire time. They're not real friends. This, this is the deciding, this is the line in the sand for friends. And so the dilemma that I get in is when people move and they come and ask me, hey, will you help me move on Saturday? I, I know I'm like stuck, because if I don't show up, you're going to realize I'm not really your friend, <laughs> and everything in me doesn't want to come. So if you can imagine this, that Gabe comes to me one day, and there's a group of guys, and Gabe's like, hey, can you, you know, can you come help me move on Saturday? Well, immediately, all of us are like, you know, don't make eye contact with Gabe, as I'm <laughs> frantically trying to find some reason why I can't come on Saturday. I know there's something I have to do. I can't, no. And then, you know, and then one guy raises his hand and says, I'll, I'll help you move, Gabe. And Gabe says, well, then I choose you. In the kingdom, this is how it works. The issue is not to call. 
The reason why there are many called but few are chosen is because there's only a handful that raise their hand. The third thing, the E stands for encourage. You see, a dream, when you get it, will encourage you. There's something about a dream that brings encouragement and joy to people's lives. It gives you excitement. It encourages you. The people who are depressed, the people who are discouraged are the people who don't have a dream. Because when you have a dream, it makes you get up in the morning. It makes you put your clothes on and go to work because you've got a dream. And a dream has the power to encourage you. Unbelievable. I think about Lester Sumrall. Lester was way up in his 70s, maybe early 80s, when I had lunch with him at Ralph and Kaku's here one day, and he started crying about Christians in parts of the world that have no food and no clothing, literally had nothing to put on their bodies. And he began to cry, and he said, I need a, a ship, and I need a C-130 plane, and, and, I need, and he started talking about things that cost millions and tens of millions of dollars. The man's nearly 80 years old. You know, he bought all those things before he died at 83. And he said something one time that I'll never forget. He said, fulfillment in life comes from building a house, not from living in the house. And you need to remember that because... A lot of people just think, well, you know what? I'm just going to lay back my recliner with my remote control. But there's no excitement in that. When you see the slab, when you see the two befores, the sheetrock, the shingles, there's this excitement. There's this blueprint that's in front of you. There's the house. That's the house of my dreams. People call it my dream house. Because the excitement of it is building it. Once it's built, you just go in there and you know what? Just hang your clothes up, go sit in your chair and... Eat banana ice cream or whatever you're doing. That's it. So he said, you got to always have a dream. Follow that dream. It's never too late. The second thing is you need to make a plan. Make a plan. People that have a dream without a plan are in a nightmare. Then the A stands for it affects prevailing attitudes. When you have a dream, it will always, it will always attack prevailing attitudes. Oral and Wilbur Wright were sons of a Methodist preacher. And he got up and preached. He's a bishop. And he got up and preached one day and said, if God wanted men to fly, he would have made them with wings. But those two boys felt a challenge in their heart to the prevailing attitude of their father. And they went out at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, and they broke through the prevailing attitude that man cannot fly. And they changed the world with that dream. Because when you have a dream that God gives you, it will always affect your attitude. And usually you'll have to combat, you'll have to combat prevailing attitudes. There will always be, you know, dreams shatter common held attitudes of the day. It can't be done. It's never been done before. Nobody's ever done it and succeeded. You, you better, no, no, no. Anytime you have a dream. This morning, I want to talk to you about the struggle of legacy. Because if you're going to if you're going to see the God-ordained legacy that he's deposited in your life come to pass, there's going to be a struggle. How many, how many of you have already had some of that struggle? You know what I'm talking about. Well, I'm going to encourage you, and for the rest of you, I'm just going to give you a little bit of, of faith that when that time comes, you're going to be victorious in the struggle of legacy because as we look back today on Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and even Joseph, we're going to see how they struggled to fulfill the legacy that God had for them. And that's where we have to be ready to fight for the legacy that God has for us. Jesus had to go to the cross. He was our model. He was our example. Paul had to struggle to fulfill the legacy that God had for him. He fought the good fight of faith. You know, it's not the good comfort of faith. Come on, somebody. It's the good fight of faith. Good news is there's going to be seasons where you're going to just soar in the things of God. 
You go, I mean, the winds are going to blow just right, and you're going to lift off like the eagle, and you're going to soar up into the heights, and you're going to enjoy the presence of God, and, and you're going you're gonna to love being in the house of God, and you're going to love the people of God, and you're going to love reading your Bible, and everything is just going to be awesome. And when those times are going on, you need to be thankful and grateful, and you need to be like, Lord, thank you for this season. My car note is paid. My house note is paid. Everything's going right at my job. Nobody's persecuting me. And, and we rejoice in those times. But unfortunately, that's not all the time. I wish that it was. I wish once we got saved, everything was just like clockwork. We just served the Lord and had a happy life, and then we went to heaven. But there are struggles because we live in this world. And in this world, Jesus said, you will have trials and tribulations, but fear not, for I have overcome the world. And so that's kind of the part that we're keying in on today where, you know, we need to know how to act when things are right and we need to know how to act when things are wrong. We, we need to know how to have faith in the good times and we need to know how to have faith in the bad times. The struggle that Abraham had for legacy was the struggle of impossibility. I mean, he said, God, this old body of mine, imagine when Abraham's 95 and Sarah's 85. You talk about impossible. That's impossible right there. And, and we have things, and, and impossibility to me is a long-term problem. It's something that's just been going and going and going and going, and it's done got to the point where your mind, the devil, your best friend, everybody has told you that's impossible. For me, it's been in my health. It's just been year after year after year. Uh, I went on uh, August 25th. It was 18 years since I went on dialysis. And you better believe I know the dates. I know exactly when it started. And praise God, I'm going to know exactly when it finishes. But the Abraham faced impossibility. And you know, I, and for each one of these, I'm going to give you an answer. And the answer to impossibility is summed up in the word hope. Hope, the word hope. Romans 4.18 is my theme verse for this year. And it said, even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping. Come on, I want him to put it up on the screen. I want you to see it. I, I, I want to make sure you know I didn't just make it up. Here it is. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham just kept on hoping. That don't make any sense. You say, hey, give it up, man. It's over. But you know what? It's not over. It's not over until God says it's over. And Abraham, he just kept believing. He just kept hoping. Many of you were, were here at the end of last year. When I How many of you heard when I preached on hope at the end of last year? Many of you were here. I ministered on the subject of hope. The Lord gave me a prophetic word last December. He said, I want you to start preaching on hope. And I said, okay, Lord, I'll start preaching on hope. And I said, but you got to show me something about hope. And the Lord said to me, he said, hope is seeing light at the end of the tunnel when you're standing in the pitch black. It's seeing with the eyes of your spirit a reality that completely defies the reality you're living in. So I started preaching on hope. I preached on hope every, the Lord said, I want you to preach on hope every Sunday. And I preached on hope every Sunday for the first three months of this year. And then all hell broke loose. And all kind of things happened, and, and I ended up in the hospital and, and was out for three months and had to cancel everything and just laying on the couch at the house, just trying to get strength back, trying to get blood levels right, having surgeries, doing all kind of stuff. And the devil was saying, uh-huh, where's your hope now? He was trying to magnify the pitch black part. And you got to magnify by faith. You got to magnify the light at the end of the tunnel part. And many of you have, uh, that have been around the church for a long time, you know the struggle that I've had in 1999. I had a kidney transplant. didn't work. They said it'll never work because the problem we discovered is in your blood. It's not in your kidneys. And any transplant you have, it's just going to take it out like it did that one. So we've just been going and going and going. 14 years have gone by since that transplant. And I've just been doing everything I could do under the power of, of the Holy Spirit and just pressing on. And that's what you got to do. You can't just give up and wait on things to get perfect. You just got to keep going. You got to keep saying, hey, I, I'm going to leave a legacy. 
There might be a mountain in the way, but I'm going to show up at the ocean eventually. I, I'm going to get there eventually. And so i just been, been preaching and, and even defying the devil, saying, hey, I'm going to travel. And when you're on dialysis to travel, is you just don't do that. And, uh, but I've been doing that anyway. I said, hey, I'm going to move over to Dallas so I can travel better. And uh, so Amy and I have been running all over the country, preaching the gospel, prophesying to people, seeing young people set free, just the moves of God and the river of God flowing and doing all that. But this summer, after coming out of a season of really of great difficulty, my doctor, Dr. Crandall, called me, and he said, Joel, I think there's been a change. Now, I know... I know many of you have heard this before, but there's the facts and there's the truth. And the facts are subject to change. The truth is never subject to change. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, by his stripes I was healed. It, and that's not subject to change. It's not subject to interpretation. It's subject to faith. And so we've just been believing. We've just been plowing on, doing what we can do, going on. And so he sent us up to uh, Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, and we met with their team there, the transplant team there, and they said, well, what's happened is there's been a change in our technology, in our research, and now the issue that you have in your blood is something that we can treat very easily now. So they said, they said we're going to deal with that problem in the blood, and then we're going to give you a transplant, and you're coming off dialysis. And you're going to be able to go to the nations. You're going to be able to preach the gospel. You're going to be able to do everything that's in your heart to do. Praise God. Woo! God is good. Every impossibility must bow to the name of Jesus. Keep hope alive. And then the M stands for motivate. A dream will motivate you. A dream will motivate you. It's like nuclear energy in your soul when you get a dream. Uh, and your energy will be in proportion to your dream. Um, they did a study recently, and they studied people who retired early. People who retired early. And every time they found that people who retired early with nothing to do, they had nothing to do, they, three years later, went into a decline in health because they had nothing to excite them, nothing to motivate them, nothing to challenge them. And my point to you is if you don't have, if you don't have a goal, if you don't have something to stimulate your brain, if you don't have something that keeps you sharp and focused, if you don't have challenges, you won't stay alive. You, you, you could drop into a pile of dust pretty quick if you don't have any. I don't care how old you are. I don't care who you are. You need a dream. Dreams motivate us. They energize us. They fire us up. And some of you need to understand that a dream is what you need. You don't need guppies in your tank. Some of you, you, you don't like strong leadership. You need a shark in your tank to keep you alive, to keep you moving, to keep you, what are you doing? Are you reaching any goals? We want it easy. We don't want to do anything. But God is a God who wants to give you a dream that drives you. Dream problems are the best problems. Listen, in life you're going to have problems. And if you don't do nothing, you're going to have problems. But if you've got a dream, you're going to have problems. I'd rather create my problems and move toward my dream and have to deal with problems that are getting me to my dream than do nothing. So either way, you're going to have problems. Dream problems are the best problems. So get a dream. So our goal is not to go out and make a living, make our own way, make our own money, do our own thing. Our goal is to live the life that God has called us to. That means staying sensitive to God, doing things that seem right between you and the Lord, right? You're, you're seeking God. You're saying, God, direct my steps. Help me with my education. Get me into the right career. And, and that awareness and that sensitivity, he leads and guides you. Mistakes happen. We all miss it along the way. He directs even our mistakes, get worked into his plan, even our failures. You went through the divorce. You went through the bankruptcy, whatever it was. He works that in. God's bigger than our mistakes. 
God's greater than our own problems, and he gets us to where he wants us to go as long as we'll stay sensitive and seek him and make it a priority to be the person that God has created us to be. Come on, say amen. Right? If your priority is something else, shift it this morning. If your priority is something else, change it this morning to be the person God's called you to be. Along the way then, rather than, oh, I'm so happy I got a new popcorn maker last week. Oh, it was a great week. I bought a new couch. Right? Rather than your life becomes defined by positions and possessions. Rather than having your life defined by positions and possessions. By being that person, now you start touching people. You start impacting people and changing their life for eternity. And when you get to heaven... You're going to be so happy about that. Heaven rejoices over one soul. You know, we often say things like, just think if you were the person that won Billy Graham to the Lord. And all the people that Billy Graham got say, isn't that wonderful? Just think if you were the one that won Billy Graham to the Lord because of all the people that he reached for Christ. Well, that's true. And that's nice. But think of this, reaching that one person named Billy Graham was as important as all the people that he reached for Christ. See, just think of the one. Someone said to me the other day when they heard the story of how uh, Julius won me to the Lord and then Christian Faith Center grew out of what happened in my life. Isn't it great how Julius was able to rejoice and to celebrate and to receive the reward of all of this. And I said, yeah, but it's, it's, it's equally as important that he won one little old drug addict to the Lord. See what I'm saying? Don't think I need to win somebody that's going to reach a thousand. Think if I reach one person, they're important. And I might be the only one that can impact them, that can touch them. So we start getting our priorities shifted. Our life is not defined by positions. I got a raise, I got a job, they gave me a title, I got a new office. Or possessions. I got the car, I got the condo, I got the house. No. Life is more than positions and possessions. It's influence that will last forever. It's people that you can impact their eternity. 